Okay, so um, I'm Elena D'Agostino. I am the public defender of Solano County. Um, so what that means is what the public defender office does. So we represent individuals who are unable to afford an attorney who are facing a loss of liberty. Most of the time that means uh, you're looking at going to jail for committing a crime, and that's probably 95, 99% of the people we represent, adults and juveniles. We also represent some people in civil commitments. So as an example um, that Mr. Telfian was just talking about, the child support cases where folks are ordered to pay child support, but they are unable to pay. Uh, those folks here in Solano County are often charged with criminal contempt, and they're looking at five days in jail for every missed payment. It's also a separate misdemeanor, and back when I was doing misdemeanors some 20 years ago, they used to file it that way, um, but now they just file it as criminal contempt um, cases. We represent those folks. And we also represent people who are facing civil commitments like conservatorships, um, you know, that Britney Spears situation, um, people who are facing a loss of liberty, you know, for, for, for medical or mental health issues. Um, so those are our clients. Um, we are, you know, there are a lot of stereotypes of public defenders out there. Our clients sometimes call us public pretenders or dump trucks. Uh, like, you know, when I was new, it'd be like, so how long do you have to do this before you get to be a DA? You know, you're not a real lawyer. Um, but the fact is that people who go into public defense, particularly today, are incredibly committed to serving people who, you know, have nowhere else to go. Um, it's, it's, we are, we are committed to providing the very best representation to our clients not just adequate, which is what the constitution requires. Adequate under the constitution can mean you sleep through the trial. There have been death sentences that have been upheld by the US Supreme Court where the lawyers fell asleep during trial. So we're shooting for higher than that. <laughs> we, we aim and I believe we succeed in providing a higher quality of defense than your average private attorney out there. Um, now, if you have hundred thousand dollars to spend on a lawyer you you're you're going to get a different level of defense um but your average middle class person who's you know um trying to find somebody we do a really good job we're really committed we work together as a team we um we're in court every day we know the judges we know the prosecutors we know the cops we know the law we're doing these cases all the time so we do a really good job that said we are a county department um, in California, we are funded by, public defense is funded by the counties. It's not funded by the state. Uh, it's actually, we are one of the very few states that are funded that way. Um, the other states are places like Alabama and Arkansas. And uh, so we're not in great company. Most of the, um, the bigger states have a statewide system. Uh, when you're funded by the county and you're paid by tax dollars in the county, there's a lot of fluctuation into um, funding issues. And you're, I believe, more at the whim of uh, political wins, right? So we are a, a, a well-funded office, but um, our caseloads are higher than they should be. Um, we, you know, and, and it's gotten worse during COVID because a lot of cases have been continued over the year, over the past two years. There's not a lot of stuff happening. Um, cases aren't finishing. so. We have cases that keep coming in and cases that aren't finishing at the same rate. So caseloads are going up. Um, we are also don't have the same level of resources. You know, um, we have seven, we get about 10,000 cases a year in the public defender's office here in Solano County. Uh, we have seven investigators on our staff for 10,000 cases. Um, the district attorney has more investigators on their staff. I can't remember the exact number, it's probably about double, but they also have the opportunity to call upon every police department in the county um, if they need help investigating. So if they have a, if we get a case out of Vallejo, we have to come into one of our, assign one of our investigators. They have the whole Vallejo police department that they can say, hey, we need this information. Can you help us get this information? Um, so that's just an example of how the resources are different for public defenders. Um, you know, as a practical matter. Um, 
So I'm going to move on. I know I was looking at your. Um, so um, I have I pulled up a couple of quotes that I feel really explain how the criminal justice system works. And I saw your read uh, in your re reading materials is just mer mercy. And this is one of Brian Stevenson's quote, which is we have a criminal justice system that treats you much better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. And that is absolutely my experience in, in Solano County and wherever I worked before. Uh, it's just the way it is. If you, if you don't have the money to make things happen, um, you, you kind of get steamrolled and we do our best to, to prevent that, but I, I believe that to be true. And then the, um, the one from Anatoly France, which I think talks a lot, speaks to Mr. Telfian's uh, comments, which is the law in its majestic equality forbids both rich and poor alike from sleeping under bridges, begging in the streets and stealing loaves of bread. And it's that idea that, oh, the law applies equally to everybody. You know, but we know that that's not true, that, you know, people don't sleep under bridges if they have a choice, o overwhelmingly true. So what I'm going to do is I have um, kind of an overview of how poverty affects the criminal justice system. Like, I could talk about any of these for uh, little segments for an hour or so, but I'm going to kind of go over it in general and, you know, there'll be time for questions afterward. The policy is a lot of like um, what equal justice under law is trying to change. So there are financial based laws, but then there's other ones that um, are a little less obvious, right? Uh, and I know, I'm sure I heard a lot of you have heard about the sentencing disparities for powder and rock cocaine. Those have pretty much been eliminated in California. They've been reduced in the federal system. Um, but there's no real reason to have different punishments for different hard drugs, um, but they do persist and, and people do, people are still serving sentences, lengthy sentences, uh, you know, for a longer sentence for, for raw cocaine than for powder. And, and why is that? Why, you know, there's just no reason for it. There are also um, crimes that target dense communities. So on you know, on its face, it's like, oh yeah, you shouldn't have a gun near a school or sell drugs near a school, right? But but we're and and those are the those are called enhancements or, um, and that's that happened when those that happens, you you're facing a, a longer sentence. So say you get three years for serving for having a gun. If you have a gun near a school, you get another three years. So it's six, right? Um, that's not a crime that's going to be violated that often in the suburbs, right, or in rural communities. It's it's a it's it's a it's a enhancement that targets cities, and what it really does is it targets poor communities because those are the people who are um, living near the schools or 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 experiencing um, you know doing, and they may not. It doesn't. You don't even have to have an intent to have anything to do with the school. You could be walking out of your front door, which is across the street or around the block of the school, and you get stopped and searched and in violation of this law, you're getting your sentence increased because you are close to a school. Uh, so these are, um, you know, and, and the other examples the, the, that we were talking about earlier, we represent a ton of people who get pulled over for equipment violations on their car. So your tail lights out, right? Um, if you don't have the money, it's not always cheap to fix a tail light. You can't fix a tail light. You're getting pulled over, you're getting a ticket. Maybe you're lucky you just get the ticket. Maybe the cop decides to search your car. Um, you know, some of our clients, they drive a car that other people drive. It's like there's a car for the household. And so, you know, uh, you know, you get to drive it this day, Last week, your uncle was driving it and your, your sister's boyfriend drove it, you know, two days ago. So you may not know everything that's in there and maybe there's something illegal in there and the cops are, are, um, are more likely to, we're going to talk about that in the next section. Um, the, you know, so you're in this situation where, you know, you have a broken taillight, can you afford to pay it? Now you have a ticket, can you get to, you, you have this broken taillight, are you going to drive to court? To pay your ticket with a broken taillight? Uh, 
you don't pay the ticket, your license gets suspended. It's this, it's this, um, this cycle that, that continues. Um, and, you know, how do you get to court if you have a driver's license in Solano County? You cannot actually get from Vallejo to Fairfield on public transportation and be in court at 8.30. We tested it out. You're lucky to get here at 10. Um, you, there's no one bus. You have to take three buses. And, you know, the, the court starts at 8.30. So these are the kinds of, like, very subtle things that, um, that nobody's actually saying we're going to punish poor people, but end up punishing poor people. So policing, you know, this is a really interesting area, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've read about the studies, you know, that people of color are much more likely to get pulled over by the police. Uh, people of color are more likely to get searched once they're pulled over, even though the police are less likely to find any kind of illegal items. Um, you know, when, whether to, when, when somebody's committed a crime, the police often for lower level crimes have the opportunity to just give you a citation like a traffic ticket, come to court in a couple of weeks. But they also have the power to cite, to arrest you. And how do they make that decision? Who gets arrested and who gets cited? Um, who gets force used against them? I mean, there's lots of studies that black and brown people uh, get force used against them much more likely than others. And, and where do we put our police, right? Where are their police um, deployed? You know, they, there's this perception that drug use is prevalent only in like cities and downtowns, but actually the studies say that drug use is pretty evenly distributed around our communities. It's not just poor people, it's not just black and brown people, it's not just people in the cities, but the police don't go around the suburbs and just, you know, walk up to people and ask them if they can search them, which is what happens to our clients. Our clients are just walking down the street, minding their own business. Hey, how are you doing today? Can I talk to you? That's a consensual encounter. It doesn't involve the constitutional right uh, to be free from search and seizure. And if you say, yes, sure, I'll talk to you. You're, you know, that's, uh, that's on you. And you are now consenting this interaction. And, he's, and the cops, you know, he's like, hey, what are you doing? What are you up to? Uh, do you mind if I, you know, pat you down? And one thing leads to another. And um, the, this, is, this is how um, the police treat, in my experience, poor people and people of color differently than, than you know, middle class, wealthier white people. Um, you know, one example that I like to give is I grew up in New York City and I jaywalk. I am much more likely to jaywalk than I am to obey any kind of traffic signals. Uh, I have never been contacted by a police officer about it. But we represent people all the time whose initiation with the, it, the that where jaywalking was the initiation of their contact with the police here in Solano County all the time. So why is that? Why didn't I get, why, why don't they, when I'm crossing Texas Street over here, <laughs> why don't I get asked, uh, what am I doing or get a ticket? The other part of policing is I think it's really, there's been a shift in a lot of ways that we look to the police to solve social problems. And, you know, lots of, so that, that's all, it's good in a lot of ways. Like, for example, you shouldn't, you know, if you're having a dispute with your neighbor, you shouldn't punch them in the face because you're not happy with where they leave their garbage bins or something like that. But what we see in a lot of places is that the police are, are used to solve problems in poor communities where wealthy people are able to access other ways to solve their problems. So if, for example, you have a child, a, a young adult, a 20 year old kid who is out of control, he's not using drugs or he's suffering from mental illness, he won't get treatment, he won't go to the doctor, he won't take medications, Maybe it's both drugs and mental illness. Um, you know, your, your wealthier families are not gonna call the police and say, hey, get my son out of here. That's not how they're gonna handle that situation. They're gonna find a facility and they're gonna put him in a, a, a nice facility that's gonna take care of them. But in, in our community, in the poor communities, the police are called upon to serve those situations all the time. Um, we, we have, um, 
I consider this to be a terrible tragedy that we have so many clients right now who um, have restraining orders by their family members because their parents, their siblings, whatever it is, don't know how to deal with their mental illness, don't know how to deal with their drug use. And they call the police and the police tell them, you should get a restraining order so that they can't come here and bother you anymore. So they get a restraining order, but it's their child. So when their child's hungry, they let the child come over, their son come over, they feed them dinner, maybe let them take a shower, but they're like, you, you know, you can't stay here. And then when the, their son gets upset, they call the police and the police comes and arrest them. And, and we have clients who get arrested like every week for this, like constantly. They're, they come into the jail. The first few times the judges release them, they spend the weekend in jail, then they get out. Um, and eventually they get held when they have like a whole bunch of cases for violating this restraining order against their mother. Um, they get held and, you know, usually there's some kind of mental illness lurking in there that, that maybe is going to get treated, but honestly, it doesn't, it, it typically doesn't, it ends up cycling until there's some, something else that breaks it. Um, but this is a very, it's, it's a, a pretty intransigent problem. Uh, these, there's often some, a lot of overlap with the homeless community for these folks. All right. Um, Let's see. So with, with respect to prosecution, um, you know, the, the district attorney has a lot of power in the process. They decide who is actually gonna be, so what happens is the police investigate a crime and they make a report and they send it to the DA. And the district attorney makes a decision as to who's gonna get filed, char charges filed and what charges are gonna get filed. So are they gonna, you know, hey, look at this and say, this is a pretty minor thing. We're not gonna file it. Um, or maybe offer the pre-filing diversion so they don't even get that court record. Um, just, you know, maybe take a class, which costs money, um, and we won't file charges against you. Uh, what, how serious the charges are filed. So, um, and whether there are mandatory minimums, so minimum jail sentences that have to be imposed if convicted. And the, the, um, there are studies that show that black and brown folks get more serious charges filed and more mandatory minimums and um, that plea bargaining is different for for poor people and black and brown folks and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more um, in a minute and then there's you know what are the opportunities available available to you once you're charged with a crime and defending yourself um, do you have the opportunity to get out of custody can you convince a judge to release you without having to post bail um, are, you, or are you able to post bail if, if it's set? Um, if you're out of custody, are you able to get into some kind of program or treatment that's going to convince the judge or the prosecutor that you're taking this seriously, that you're not likely to reoffend, that you're able to you know, accept responsibility and, and try to change? Or, you know, you know, and often that is like access to health insurance or um, money for, for, to see, you know, can you find a counselor um, to, that can provide these services to you? Um, you know, we do, we, there's a pretty robust diversion program, but a lot of it involves having to pay, you know, maybe just $100, $150 for a class. Or if you cause some damage to something, you'll have to pay for that repair before you get your case dismissed. So diversion means you don't get they dismiss the case if you do certain things um, and it usually involves money, right? Um, so who has access to those types of situations? Um, you know, and um, let's see. And if you do go to trial, um, who's, who's gonna be on your jury? So what we find is if you, so certain people aren't allowed to serve. So up until this, actually last year in California, you couldn't serve if you had a felony conviction. Didn't matter if it was 40 years ago, uh, you couldn't serve if you had any felony conviction. Now uh, the law has changed. And once you're off probation or parole in California, you can serve on juries, which is great. Um, I think that'll help to diversify juries quite a bit. But then are you actually going to get summoned to serve? 
the the list that they use and they're just there's another new law california's been doing some great things and so up until this year um the list that they got to who to summon for jury duty was basically the dmv lists so if you don't have a driver's license or an id card you're not you're never going to get summoned for jury duty They've, they're expanding it this year. Um, they're using tax records, so that'll hopefully pull more people in. But again, not everybody files taxes, and, and so it'll still miss some folks. Are you excused for hardship? If you come in as a juror and you say, Judge, I can't spend all week here. My job won't pay me. I think they'll probably fire me. Or I have a, a, a young child at home. I don't have child care. I'm the only child provide care provider to my my baby you're going to get excused so if you're poor um you're going to get excused because you're poor um what ends up happening <laughs> we usually have juries are like half retired people honestly and the other half is government employees it's 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 really interesting and it's it's a tragedy because i think jury service is one of the most important things that we can do as a member of our community, because when else do you get to see what certain elected officials are doing? Your, your district attorney is an elected official, that judge is an elected official, the police agencies that are gonna be uh, officers that are, that are gonna be testifying, they are you know, an arm of, of your government. And it's it really is a window onto what, is going on? What are the decisions that are being made? How are the um, how how are the judges treating the players, the, the parties, the defendant? Is everybody getting treated with respect? Are they prepared? Are they taking this seriously? And and being on a jury actually shows you quite a bit of that. And I think it's really a helpful thing for people to do. Um, but so many people are just excused. Now you can get excused by saying you're afraid of COVID to a large extent. Um, and a lot of people get end up getting excused as being biased. Um, and this, there was a, a recent case out of Contra Costa where a potential juror was asked if you, she supported Black Lives Matter and she said yes. And without getting into too many details, the district attorney um, argued to the judge that that meant she was unable to be a fair to police officers and that she didn't trust the system and she wouldn't. And the judge agreed and let, and kicked her off. Um, now, if you've only hit, and, and the other example that comes up is if you've had a negative experience with the police, you can often be kicked off because, you know, that shows you're biased against the police. Doesn't, if you have positive experiences on the police, that doesn't get you kicked off for being biased. Um, but California has a new law, um, again, just took effect this year, this month. So we're waiting to see how it'll impact that. Um, does not allow judges or prosecutors or defense attorneys to, to kick people off of juries for reasons that end up being a proxy for race. And one of those is, um, you know, having had a negative experience with police officers or having um, a family member who's been in the criminal justice system, things like that. All right, so um, what does it mean to go through the criminal justice system? How does it feel, particularly as a poor person? And in my opinion, for the vast majority of the cases, and let me just tell you of our 10,000 cases, 80% of them are misdemeanors. Um, so the, the misdemeanors are the bread and butter of the criminal justice system. The process is the punishment. A lot of the misdemeanors end up getting dismissed or you know, not a lot happens on them. Um, but so say you get a ticket for a misdemeanor, whatever, um, shoplifting. I don't know, there's, there's a million misdemeanors out there. And you get you don't get arrested, you know the judge the, the police officer gives you a, a ticket, and you have to come to court, right? So you show up to court on that day, and your your name you can't find your name anywhere. So you you know you you check with the clerk, and the clerk says, oh, you know the DA hasn't filed yet. They still have another year to file. Um, so just keep checking back. 
meanwhile, you took that day off of work um, and, uh, you know, you you missed work or you had to pay somebody to take care of your child. Uh, so it's now on you to continue checking to see if the district attorney filed. You might get a letter in the mail. You, you might not. Um, you may just get pulled over one day for having your taillight out and find out you have a warrant for your arrest because you missed the date that they ended up setting and they didn't notify you. Uh, so, you know, you have to come back to court, you get arraigned um, on your first court appearance. In our office, we don't, we try really hard not to resolve cases at the first court appearance because we want to actually meet our clients and talk to them about what they need and what's going on and review the case and make sure we have all the evidence. Um, in some places, there is an effort to resolve cases quickly and there is a, there, there's some benefit because then it's done. Um, and, and whatever it is that's happening is happening. But usually that's not the best resolution that you could get is the, the resolution at the first appearance. Um, so, you know, you have to keep coming back to court. Maybe it's every two months, maybe now in COVID, it could be six months from now. And do you remember what that date is? <laughs> Did you remember to ask for it off, off of work? Um, you could have six, 10 court appearances before your case is over. Uh, and, and think of all the time and money and effort that that entails and the stress of having that hanging over you over, over the months and years until your, your, your case is resolved. Whatever happens to your case, um, maybe you get it dismissed and that's great. Maybe you get put on probation. So you're going to have to, you know, be on probation for a year and do, do some things, pay some fines, go to classes. Um, but a lot of ways, the process is more punishment than the punishment you end up getting for these low level crimes. Um, getting close on time. I'm going to just going to talk a little bit about the trial penalty and plea bargaining. Um, you know, the number, we have a lot fewer trials than, than we used to. These are, this is federal data. We don't really have very good state data, but this is consistent with my experience. And one of the main reasons for um, the fewer trials is because the laws have become, there's mandatory minimums. Uh, the sentencing is so much worse if you, if you are convicted at trial versus taking a plea bargain. Um, so I, you know, how does this work in practice? Um, what I thought I'd do is just give you a brief pitch of a, what I have said to, I don't know how many clients over the course of the career about how you decide whether to take a plea bargain or go to trial, right? So um, let's say, all right, Ms. Kelly, so you are facing a felony charge right now. We're gonna go to trial next week, but the district attorney has made an offer to you. And that offer would be to reduce that felony to a misdemeanor. You'd have to do 90 days in jail, but you wouldn't have to go to jail. You could do it on house arrest. So assuming you do everything right, you'd never have to go into jail. You'd be on probation for a year um, and you wouldn't, we wouldn't have the trial next week. I think, you know, based on all the, all we've discussed and the investigation that I've done, I think that you know, with the witnesses we have to present, I think there's a likelihood that we could win a trial. I don't think the district attorney's case is very strong, which is why they're making this offer of a misdemeanor to you. But I do need to warn you that if we go to trial next week, what could happen if we, you know, if, after the trial? So you could be found not guilty, which means the case is over and done and nothing else can happen to you. Um, but if you are found guilty of a felony, there is a possibility that the judge could take you into custody at the time of the verdict. And, and you would not be able to get re released or even argue for release um, until you're sentenced, uh, which would be a few weeks after that. Um, I don't think the judge will, I, 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 I don't know whether the judge would do it. I'd certainly have a good argument that you, 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 you know, there's no risk to the community for leaving you out of custody. Um, you know, you've been coming to court all this time, you have a job but I can't promise you that it won't happen. There's also a possibility that um, you could get a longer sentence. You could get up to two years in prison for this crime. Um, I don't think you would get the maximum, but I can't promise you that you wouldn't get jail time, that you'd have to spend time in jail. And it could be more than the 90 days. 
that the judge is offering. And uh, you would have a felony conviction if you're convicted of a felony, which can have you know, implications for your, for your future. So considering all of that, you know, I wanna encourage you to have a trial because I think it's important to, to make the prosecution prove this. I don't think they, they can prove it, um, but ultimately, you know, this is your decision, right? I don't know about you. <laughs> I would be seriously considering pleading guilty to something I didn't do in that situation, right? So um, yeah, those are the decisions we make all the, the, the conversations we have all the time. Sometimes it's the person's in custody and uh, they could get out of jail by pleading guilty, you know? So in this example, um, yeah, you could get out of jail and do the rest of that 90 days on, on house arrest. So you could finish that sentence on house arrest. If you want your trial, you're gonna have to stay in another two weeks until our trial date. What are you gonna do? I don't know, I might take, I might take that deal. Um, so, uh, some statistics, you know, more than 90% of the criminal cases that end in conviction are a result of plea bargaining with the prosecution, which is an unequal um, power dynamic, uh, as I talked about a little bit. And if you're in custody pretrial, you're more likely to plead guilty, you know, by 47%. And this study, um, all of these stats come from the Vera Institute of Justice um, report. The odds of receiving a plea offer that includes incarceration are almost 70% greater for Black people than for white people, um, which is just astonishing, but also not surprising. Because um, if you're in custody already, um, you're more likely to get an in-custody offer. And um, you know, you're more likely to end up in custody if you're poor, if you're a person of color, you're considered to be a greater risk, um, and you're less likely to bail out. So um, with that, I will stop sharing.